his heart You lead us by still waters and to mercy And nothing can keep us apart So remember your people Remember your children promise, O oh God. God of ages, stand. 
stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Alleluia, praise the one who set me free. Alleluia, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. As we come to our time of communion here this morning, I encourage you, if you have some food and drink you'd like to use to represent the body and blood of Christ, to pause the video and get that ready. I'll be opening us in a word of prayer, and then we'll use the next song, All That I Am, as a time to take communion and continue to worship Him. Dear Lord Jesus, Thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you today, God. Thank you that no matter what's going on in our lives or in this world, we can gather together in spirit to make sure that you are lifted up, God. Lord, thank you for the freedom that we have to worship you in our hearts at any moment of every day, God. Lord, please bless this time. Please bless each person listening to this service online today, God. Please bless your body spread out across the world today, Lord. Help us to be made and resilient. Help us to keep doing the right thing in these challenging times, Lord, and to keep trusting in you. Thank you so much for your death on the cross and for your resurrection, Lord. 
We look forward to seeing you again. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.
Good morning, Trinity Christian Fellowship. Happy Easter, happy resurrection. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God in heaven, thank you for resurrection. We as a human race, we try to talk ourselves out of a lot of things and a lot of destinies and a lot of hardships and bailouts and second chances and so on, Lord, but we have found that death does not negotiate. But Lord, I thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, experienced death, went through it, totally into the grave, and then rose again on the third day alive. And because of that, Lord, we do not have the same fate, those who trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We don't have the same fate as the roadkill animals alongside the road or the animal kingdom, things that just come, die, and are gone, Lord. You've designed us to be in your presence. And so, Lord, thank you for eternal life. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, which unites us all together as a scattered congregation in one heart right now, Lord. And we're thankful for Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to the book of John chapter 20, starting with verse 11. The story of the first uh, encounter with the resurrected Jesus, that is Mary Magdalene's story. And we're going to look at it uh, not so much from an analytical uh, point of view, but actually trying to step into Mary's um, perspective and the follower of Jesus Christ, their perspective on that early morning. Uh, we don't necessarily know how to relate to resurrection. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of experience at that. Um, there are cases in which, you know, like the movie Castaway, in which somebody was in an accident far away and everybody presumed them to be dead, finds out that wasn't the case. I had one of my best friends from high school. I was told he died in a tragic car accident. And then one day he was standing on my doorstep, find out, Actually, he didn't die, got real close, took months to get back going again, but no, he didn't actually die. Jesus and his death was not in that category. Jesus was publicly executed by professionals. And uh, all this was seen by his followers, the ladies and, and John there at the foot of the cross. He uh, uh, was, after he was declared dead, lowered down, they saw him involved. Hey, if they thought there was a chance that Jesus could be resuscitated, while they had the body, they could have instead of taken him to the tomb, taken him to a house somewhere and tried their best to pray him back or resuscitate him or whatever. But they didn't. Why? He was a goner. He was dead. And then he was put into the tomb after being embalmed. Guards sealed it closed. He stayed put all of Saturday, and then resurrection happened the next morning. And so Mary, the follower, just doesn't know how to relate to Jesus because she's new at this whole resurrection thing. You and I don't know how to relate to it very well either. But we're going to step into her shoes. That's one of the things you may not be able to see in your translation of, the, of this story in John chapter 20. When I read it in a little bit in my translation, and probably in your translation, you're going to notice that the verbs are just about always in the past tense. Actually, in the Greek, many of those verbs are in the present tense. John writes it that way, the Holy Spirit's prompting to draw us into the moment, because it literally says, she sees into the tomb, and she sees the men sitting at the foot and the head of the, at the place where Jesus lay. Drawing us into the moment. So let's step into that moment with Mary Magdalene. Let me read, starting with verse 11, then we'll look at a few things. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? 
They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Few things that must have uh, the resurrection to Mary Magdalene and to us at that time that would have come through very clearly. Number one is, I am a follower. Mary Magdalene was a follower of Jesus Christ. I hope you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Mary Magdalene had to figure something out, though, along with the other disciples. What does a follower do when the one you are following isn't moving anymore? Jesus was dead. He was in a tomb. Now the body's even gone. What does a person do when there is no leader to follow? Many religious movements, I suppose, when you lose your main guy, you get a replacement, a vice messiah to take over and swear him into office. Hey, James and John talked to Jesus a little bit earlier about who gets to be at the right, who gets to be at the left. But neither James or John actually applied to be Jesus Jr. There is no replacement for Jesus. There is no replacement for the apostles. They are one of a kind. They need somebody to follow. And so for those few days in there, there's nobody to follow. Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 13, he says, you've been following me, but there is a place you're, I'm going, you cannot follow. And Peter says, I will follow you, I will die for you. And he says, you wait, and then you'll be able to follow me again. But where I'm going, you cannot go. There's something unique about Jesus. And Mary Magdalene found out that morning that she is a follower. You don't need to take over for Jesus, to grab the wheel when all of a sudden he's not steering anymore. It's a walk with him. He's the one in charge. Christianity is not a concoction of mine or your personal preferences. We follow him. Mary Magdalene realized, I don't need to be Messiah now. Jesus is the only one that we need to follow. The second thing that I think must have come across Mary Magdalene's mind is that, thank goodness, I'm not going crazy. That's point number two. I've never had a point number two that says I'm not going crazy. But that must have been it for Mary Magdalene. Here's the reason. If you look at all the events strung together, you can make a case that the story of Jesus was getting erased. Erased. Okay, he died. That's bad enough. Now his body was missing. That's even worse. What happened to the crowds of Palm Sunday? Pretty much gone. Where were the disciples when Jesus was on the cruci crucified on the cross? Only one showed up. Well, maybe Mary and the family can say, well, Jesus really existed. Well, Mary, the virgin, would have said, yeah, but the rest of his brothers, they weren't on board yet. You can make a case that slowly but surely, hey, even John the Baptist, who was the one who pointed to Jesus being the Messiah, what had happened to him? He's gone too. Mary Magdalene might have wondered, what happened to this great faith that I was following? It's erased. You know, there's been quite a few movies put out about people who have a conspiracy to try to make another person kind of wonder, oh, Really, did I have a child? Did I have a husband? Did I have a wife? And so forth. And hey, historians sometimes do that when they go through rewriting history and saying whether this event really happened or not, or this person existed or did not. Mary Magdalene wondering, did I imagine this whole thing? There's no body now. Of course, Jesus comes. This verse is after we left off. She touches him. You know, he says, don't hold on to me. It's Jesus' version of social distancing, I guess. But she knew at that time, I'm not going crazy. The resurrection lets me know there really is a God who loves me and really is a Messiah who resurrected from the dead. The third thing, before you get the idea that, hey, I'm not going crazy, I must be doing okay, let's not go that far. 
Mary Magdalene also had to realize that she was faulty. Guess what? You're faulty and so am I. Now, what was Mary Magdalene faulty about? If you look at all the stories of the resurrection on Easter morning, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you put them together, because they all have different angles that they record the story at. Mary Magdalene took a different track from most. She arrives with the other ladies to the tomb to anoint the body uh, in the tomb. When they are approaching, they all wonder who's going to roll the big stone away. They get a little bit closer, they find out the stone has been rolled away. It's probably at that point, Mary Magdalene breaks with the other ladies. And she goes immediately back to where the disciples are at to tell Peter, John, and so, buddy, and so on that the tomb door is open. She does not wait around to talk with the angels that are in the tomb. She doesn't even know whether there is a body in the tomb or not. She can't see that. All she knows is the tomb is open. She departs at that point. The verses that we read are later on in the story. The thing is that between where she saw the door was opened and getting back to the disciples, she makes up her own speculation. She doesn't know there isn't a body in there, but she presumes there is not. She presumes that somebody took it. And not only does she speculate about it, she tells people her speculation that this is what happened. And so later on, after she's grieved and the other ladies have come to the tomb, heard what the angel said, go back to Peter and John and so on, um, she's really believing her speculation. We ought not to speculate sometimes because resurrection meant Mary had to realize my speculations were wrong. I was wrong. Here's a challenge for you since a lot of us have a lot of uh, sheltering in place time. If you're going through times that you've never been through these times before, one of the best things to do is to do something that you've never done before. Now this is kind of hard to do since we're all supposed to stay in our own spots. Here's the thing that maybe you've never done before. Assume you are wrong. What do I mean? It might be a wonderful Easter type thing, a sheltering in place type of task to figure, is there somebody that I've met that I never really liked them from the get-go? And uh, every time they do something wrong, I just use that to reinforce my view of them, I challenge you to challenge your own thoughts. Maybe to make the case that maybe you're wrong about them. And you can project that into other scenarios. How about a theological thought? Maybe you've been part of a church uh, or uh, listening to an evangelist on the radio or TV or a favorite author, and they've been pounding it to you year after year after year. You are right. Everybody else is wrong on whatever topic, doesn't matter to me which one you want. You want. And uh, you've been buying into that whole theme, you are right, all your life. I challenge you to challenge those thoughts. If you're holding on to the word of God and truth, it can handle being challenged. To put away from the table all the other books and thoughts and tracts and pamphlets and turn off the, the radio and the TV and... This even applies to what Al Brown says. You and the Word of God look at the total weight of Scripture, not just a few pet verses here and there. Ask the hard questions of the whole spectrum. And God's truth can handle it. God can take the test. Challenge your speculations. Other things could be on entertainment, could be on politics, could be on issues of taste, whatever it is. We all like to be told by somebody, you're wrong and everybody else is an evil idiot out to destroy everything good. Challenge your speculations. Godly things can handle the, the uh, inspection. Mary Magdalene, resurrection meant she had to realize her speculation was wrong. Third thing, Mary Magdalene must have thought, I am so unexpected, so are you and I. Unexpected. In what way? Why would Jesus appear to Mary Magdalene first? You'd think maybe Peter. I mean, he's kind of like top dog, isn't he? The last four things that Peter did for Jesus did not go off well. 
He told him, you cannot wash my feet. Jesus had a little argument with him on that. Then later on, he falls asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then he tries to kill the, the servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. And, uh, and then after that, he denied Jesus three times. Not a real good run there. So I can imagine Jesus not really wanting to show him. But how about John? John, aside from falling asleep, got it right. John was leaning on Jesus' heart at the, at the Last Supper. John was at the foot of the cross when Jesus was dying. He was there. Well, Jesus didn't show himself to him either. How about uh, the Virgin Mary? If anybody were to know her boy, it would be her, right? But he didn't. Who does he show? The outlier, Mary Magdalene. If you were to make a case, a list of witnesses for who saw the resurrection, Mary Magdalene would not be your best example. The lady had seven demons, it says, had reality issues, maybe morality issues. And in a patriarchal society, she was a woman. Jesus has this way of picking out the person that's least likely, the unexpected. Some of you, I've heard your testimonies and you've been wondering, how I on earth could Jesus choose me, want me? Good question. Ditto. Jesus does something with the unexpected. Always has, always will. The last thing is the thought Mary must have had, I am named. I am named. There's several sentences that go on in the story between Mary Magdalene and the angels that are in the tomb. Uh, that produce no insight whatsoever. Then there's a sentence or two that is exchanged between Mary Magdalene and Jesus while she thinks he's the gardener. And again, those interchanges don't provide any insight either. Then there are two words that make everything open and clear. A conversation of two words. He says, Jesus says, Mary. And Mary says, Rabboni, which means my teacher. It's like all of a sudden the vault opens up and things are understood. The, um, uh, some of the movies I like to watch are like Clint Eastwood shoot 'em up type things. And I've joked with Debbie and others about uh, Clint Eastwood movies. You could write the whole script on a three by five card because they're not about dialogue. They're about action and intensity. And you learn to describe things and experience things with intensity, not by overflowing with words. Jesus said her name. She used the name that she uses for Jesus, Rabboni, my teacher. She's the follower again. Jesus knows our name. John chapter 10, verse 3. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, the good shepherd. And the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Jesus knows your name. You go into a cemetery, you're going to see lots of names, all chiseled in, cold and inanimate. And it's important for those to be there. What stirs the heart? A voice with a name calling to you, stirring your heart. Jesus knows your name. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that your Son, Jesus Christ, knows our name and he calls our name, Lord. And for those of our church and those listening in, Lord, I pray that you would help them to know and experience Jesus calling them by name. Now, Lord, bless us in your resurrection and give us a wonderful time in the faith as we wait for things to play out here in our society. Our trust is in you, Lord. You hold our days. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now, let us say the benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.